I witnessed a homeless person transforming into a werewolf. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I've got a heck of a dogman story for you that happened to me just last week as I'm writing this. I don't know how to stretch it out for your show. It's really something that only takes a few minutes to tell, but it was the scariest thing that ever happened to me. Now, most people who aren't from around here don't know, but to the southwest of New Orleans, there's a little sort of a suburb over there called Marrero. Actually, there are a few neighborhoods like Harvey and West Wego, and they basically form a barrier between New Orleans and whatever lurks out in those swamps. And we've got some legendary swamps, obviously. So at the southernmost street of this southernmost suburb, butting up against the Jean Lafitte National Historic Park and Preserve was some scrubland with swampy tall weeds growing up on it. And as I walked past this scrubland on my way to visit an acquaintance one dark and creepy night, I noticed a man who was either deceased or else sleeping on the edge of that swamp across the Rue Louis Philippe from me. As I got closer to the man, I kept checking on him across the street there because I was curious if he was still with us or if he might need assistance or what. Suddenly, the man's body erupted into convulsions so severe that at points I saw him literally bounce off of the ground over there. It was such a horrible thing to see that my first instinct was to run away. And in retrospect, I probably should have just gone with that. I rushed toward him as though I knew some way to help, which I did not. Then, I saw that with each spastic convulsion, his body had more and thicker fur coming out of it. First, each strand of fur seemed incredibly thick, like a magic marker. But gradually, the fur began to spread out and look more like the pelt of a wolf or a dark gray shaggy canine. I was trying to understand what I was seeing, and then I heard an adult male voice say, Fractals. It wasn't the suffering man on the ground. The voice came from someone about my height, standing just to my right. Only I didn't see anyone standing there when the word was said. As I puzzled about the disembodied voice situation, the man's moans changed into something a lot more like growling. And as a consequence, all of my attention reverted to him. He was now entirely covered in that thick, shaggy kind of animal fur. But also his head had elongated. His ears were now grotesquely stretched way up over the top of his head. He wasn't even slightly human any longer. He was now some form of a wolf or a dog. The man or former man's growling became louder as he jerked himself up to a two-legged standing position like an extinct giant ground sloth I think I saw in a museum one time. Maybe I saw a video about a museum with that exhibit. I can't remember, but I do remember that the sloth was taller than a modern man. So was this creature. It was thinner than a sloth, thinner than a bear, muscular as all hell, and its teeth were longer than my fingers. I do remember running away, but I don't remember how I came to decide that I should do that. I ran around the corner onto either Constantine Drive or maybe Fernando Court and I slammed directly into a cop who was just walking there randomly for whatever reason, I don't know. He was extremely sarcastic in reaction, like, well, 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 where are we running to? And I was like, our funeral if we don't move. And then right on cue, there was that big dog man that used to be a wino just a minute or two earlier. He was coming around that corner at both of us, and we both just ran. I mean, we ran like crazy men. We must have looked like we were reenacting the filming of a Keystone Cops comedy or something. It turned out that Officer Sarcasm was parked down in the middle of that block, so he must have been around the neighborhood for some very specific reason. He dove into his car 
and I banged on the side door until he finally let me ride in the back like I was a criminal. The guy took so long getting his cop car started that the freaking dogman had caught up to us and it was absolutely going nuts all over this guy's cruiser. He was trying to talk on his little cop car phone thing and he was just stuttering all over the place. I got fed up and tried to answer the questions for him and I got shouted at a little bit. I can't say I wasn't asking for it. We were both pretty scared. I never expected to ever see a dog man in all my life, but I especially never expected to see one wearing clothes while I was in the back seat of a cop car. So eventually the cop figured out how to start his car and then he found out that by using the car to drive, we could remove ourselves from this situation. I was quite proud of him for putting that together on his own. Fortunately for us, the dogman only chased us for a few blocks, and neither of us got our head eaten off. I gotta tell you, I have never seen a more frantic or savage kind of an animal. Like a bear won't get that mad unless you mess with its food or its offspring. I don't even know why this guy had a problem with me. Maybe just because I saw him change into his current form. I couldn't help seeing his transformation. I was trying to see if he needed medical assistance. That's what you get if you try to be a good Samaritan these days. My friends tell me I saw a Lugaru, a wizard who knows how to transform himself into a werewolf. When I told them where I found him and in what state, they say maybe he was a great wizard who had fallen on hard times. They tell me that it's good luck to survive a dogman or rougarou encounter. At least, it's better luck than not surviving the time that. Not surviving the time that. <laughs> I witnessed a homeless man transforming into a werewolf. G is and he's swell, he's Michael A. Bell. Did you know that you can see our weekly Sunday night secret uncensored dogman stories for as little as 99 cents or $1.50 per month? Not only would you be doing a good deed in helping us to stay on the air, not only would you become a Scary Stories executive producer, but you would also get to see four stories per month that we could never show on this channel due to YouTube's guidelines for commercial channels. We also have additional perks at higher levels, and you can check it out at either peterbernard.com or else by clicking on that join link under this or any of our videos on YouTube. Henry will be along at the very end of the show with more details, but I think we've got an hour of dogman stories to tell you before then. If I'm not incorrect, I think this next one is another Louisiana dogman story, and we call this one Dogman Behind the Dollar General. Dear Scary Stories NYC, Have you ever been living on the wrong side of the tracks, spending your days where nothing different ever happens, or nothing good anyhow? And then, suddenly, right there in your crappy part of town, there goes a real honest-to-goodness celebrity. Well, that's what happened to me the night that I was driving over to visit a sweet young friend of mine, and my path was crossed by none other than the North American upright walking canid, or as we call him here locally, the Rougarou. This is a story that happened to me personally in Tangipaho, Louisiana, way, way back when I still had my first car, which was a beaten down old golden colored Buick. I was driving that golden chariot north on Soul Street, and I admit that I was drowsy. I couldn't wait to get back to the lady's home where I was going to be spending that night. So when I'm about to tell you about how I went out of my way to follow this creature once I had it in view, I hope you understand that it really made a big impression on me at the time. It woke me up and I willingly delayed getting to hang out with a truly fine woman just so I could witness this incredible animal for just a little while longer. I was still young then, too, under 25, for a healthy man from Louisiana to be willing to delay spending time with a love partner because he saw something out of the ordinary. 
That means he really saw something out of the ordinary. Please don't be one of those people that tell me I was seeing a bear with mange on that night. I have seen bears with mange, or at least I've seen photos of them. I agree they do resemble canines in some superficial ways, and I agree that they are large. But I'm not going to even slow down my car when I see a bear with mange if I've got a lovely young woman willing to let me sleep over. Heck, that would even be true today, and my drive to reproduce isn't even half what it used to be. So here is what happened to me way back however long it was ago. 25 years, 35, I don't know, I forget how to count when it comes to memories like this. For me, this story is so current, it's even still happening right now. It's almost like I don't have to remember it, because I can watch it as it happens, because it's always happening in my brain. This was one of those moments that defines your life. One of those moments you never stop going over in your mind. Sometimes I'll wake up from dreaming about it and I'll realize something I should have done differently and then I'll try to apply that new knowledge and I find out that it isn't really happening anymore. It happened a long time ago, but I'll never get it out of my head. Like I said, I was driving on Soul Street and I had just crossed over center. Once I was on that other side, I saw this big strange guy lumbering up to the road from off in the distance to my right. Once this guy gets on the road, I can see that it's not a man at all, but some kind of hairy beast that just got it in its mind to walk upright, almost like a man. Its face resembled a jackal, and the first thing I thought of was that upright walking humanoid jackal Anubis from ancient Egyptian mythology. So part of me was instantly awed and feeling like I was encountering a living myth. But then I also remember another part of me studying what I could tell about the creature's front paws or hands from where I was sitting. This was because I had a theory that it was walking upright because it might have hurt its front paws or arms. There was a bear that always used to make the human interest story on the news because it would walk upright. And it turned out, that bear had learned to do it because of an injury to one of its front legs. I did not see anything that looked damaged about those upright walking dog arms. But then again, I was looking from quite some distance away, and it was nighttime. The creature, whatever it was, crossed right in front of my car diagonally across the road and didn't pay me no mind whatever as it did so. After it crossed that road, it passed behind that place that became the Dollar General more recently. I saw it was heading over toward where they've got the Chevron station. I forget what it was back then. I just remember I did a U-turn and drove over back onto Center Street. Sometimes I could see the werewolf and then I would lose him as he darted left and right. Sometimes he'd be hiding behind things and acting suspiciously. And other times he'd just walk a straight line brazenly between two locations standing straight and tall. I couldn't tell if he was unintelligent or if he was the most intelligent. So I was driving slowly, not wanting to get as close to the creature as I had before. There was no traffic, so I didn't have to worry about getting in anyone's way. If any cars had come along, I'd have flagged them down so I could have a second witness to what I was seeing, you know? Believe me, this was an event for me. It was bigger than driving down a back alleyway and finding a star-studded debut for the new Spider-Man movie. My heart was beating fast, and I knew that I was never going to have another night like that again for the rest of my life. So I watched the dog man walk across the road from right to left, crossing down past the very edge of the gas station and on beyond it. When it reached the tree line past there, it seemed to turn slightly to the right and continue out of my sight. You could hear it for a while, crunching the vegetation out of his way to go wherever it was that old dogman wanted to go. Now, when it was crossing center, I got a pretty good view of it in my headlights for one and a half or maybe two steps. It really did walk on the balls of its feet like a wolf, 
but it only used its back legs. The hind legs of a four-legged animal are not built to hold up the entire body weight of the creature, but this one looked perfectly natural and graceful while walking on his hind legs. He didn't look as though this were a secondary way of moving that he had taught himself after an accident. It looked like this was how he had always walked. I do admit, all that weight being balanced on two wolf foot pads did look like some kind of magic act, but at the same time, the creature's fluid motion made it look like a logical animal design. The creature's eyes did reflect bright eye shine like a house cat when it was in the darkness, but when it walked in front of my headlights, its eyes went to pitch black like the way people describe the black-eyed kids. The creature's fur was gray in color like a bat. Once it went into those woods, I was too chicken to go after it. I sat there idling for a while, sort of hoping to get one more glimpse of the only monster I've ever seen in my life, but also kind of happy not to see any more of it. When I got over to see my girl, she wasn't as excited about the Rougarou as I had been, and then we just started quarreling and bickering. That's why I'm of the opinion that it's bad luck to see a dogman or a Rougarou. These days, I'm happily married to a lady who loves to listen to anything about dogman or cryptids. She says that the Rougarou isn't any kind of werewolf at all. It's not a shapeshifter, and it doesn't change back into a wizard or a brujo in the morning. In her opinion, the one that I saw most likely wandered over from the Sandy Hollow Wildlife Management Area, and it's probably a native but undiscovered species. You know, my woman uses big words, and she seems pretty certain that she's correct, so maybe she is. I still kind of feel like the creature I encountered on those empty Louisiana streets on that night so long ago was not just some weird dog or bear offshoot that I happened to see for random reasons. I think it was a magical creature made by a magical man and had walked through my life for some epic and mythic reasons far too large for me to ever understand. That wasn't just a mammal with ticks and fleas. It was a living, thinking, magical, and mythic being. And I was lucky enough to witness the dog man behind the Dollar General. We love our fans. They all make my day, especially that they're Adam Friday. Please join us in thanking Adam Friday for making this episode possible. In exchange, Adam gets to see our secret uncensored Sunday night stories, and so can you. Just either join our PayPal subscribers club at peterbernard.com, or else click that shiny jolly join button under this or any of our videos to become a Scary Stories channel member. Dogman and the Sleuth of Bears Dear Scary Stories NYC, I am back in Pennsylvania to handle some family affairs after the passing of my father, and it's brought back a flood of memories. One of them, which I'd like to get off my chest, was the time that my father and I saw a dogman and some bears. It was the weirdest thing that ever happened to me, and it turned my dad's life from a lighthearted and fun one to a kind of serious and sort of operatic one after that. The dog man can have a bad effect on your sense of humor. At least that's been my family's experience with the creature or entity or animal or whatever it actually is. I honestly don't remember what year it was, but let's say in the range of 1978 to 1980. I was between 14 and 16 years of age because that was the period where Dad and I did outdoors activities together. No, the dogman didn't scare us back indoors. Dad's new girlfriend scared me away. But that's another story. So, it was one of those three winters, and it was just me and my dad out in the snow in western Pennsylvania. He seemed so wise to me back then, but he was probably guessing half the time. Still... 
That was one of the better times, and I prefer to remember him from that era. There are exceptions to every rule, though, and there is one episode from that period in which my father and I both learned a lot about the limitations of his worldview. So, we hiked around some trees on a snowy day in the Allegheny National Forest, and there, off to the right, a tall, dark, upright, as in bipedal creature was walking the last few steps into a tree line before disappearing from our view. I was astounded. It didn't look real. The legs were too short on the bottom. I was thinking that it was a man in a costume, but the knees would have been too low, and as a consequence, my mind was spinning. It's a bear, my father whispered to me, and then in my mind, it was. I had heard they walked upright. Then I remembered I had seen it on Gentle Ben. My father was right. It had only been a bear walking upright. I felt a sense of relief that it was walking upright away from us. And then my father whispered again into my ear, this time saying, let's follow it. As we trotted toward the woods we had seen the dangerous carnivore and man-eater head toward, I questioned my father's judgment for one of the first times ever. Along the way, he lectured me that most bears had already started their hibernation and that it was rare to see a bear still out in the snow. He was going on and on about how we might get to see a bear choosing its hibernation spot, and so on and so forth like that. Then, we came around some trees, and way off down the way we could see that bear again. It was still walking upright like that, and when we saw it, the creature seemed to be trying to catch up to another upright bear walking in front of it. I guess there are two of them wanting to hibernate together, I snarked at my dad, who was wide-eyed, and told me those two bears were both adult males. I didn't get why he thought that made it impossible that they'd want to hibernate together, but we were from different generations. I followed dad as we ran top speed to a location he said might afford us a better view if we got there fast enough. From behind the big old knotted tree, we both caught our breath as quietly as we could and observed the most unnatural natural scene I've ever seen even to this day. There they were, passing by in a valley down below us. Not two, not three, but four upright walking bears, a sleuth of bears, and they marched in that same zoned out way. There was some movement in the woods, and then in front of the parade of upright bears marched some entirely other kind of creature. I felt like my mind was silly putty as I once again was witnessing something I hadn't known was even real. My first thought was that this was a deformed bear, as its legs were so long. When it took a second elegant step, I saw how athletic and coordinated and perfectly balanced the creature was, and I understood that it was in no way deformed. It wasn't a bear, though. It was some other kind of animal. But what kind of animal lives in western Pennsylvania that's as tall as an adult bear, walks bipedally, and has long dog legs that it walks on. The Pennsylvania werewolf, whispered my father. I didn't know what he was talking about, and that was the end of his lectures for the evening. Every time he had explained to me what we were witnessing, it had turned out he had been talking out of his other end. Finally, my dad closed his mouth and opened his eyes. He guided me through the woods, on a course parallel to the dogman and the bears, but at the very edge of the range within which we could make them out. The hiking was tough, especially in the snow, 
but I managed to keep up with my dad, and I was anxious to see where the parade of upright walking man-eaters was going. The thing is, as we passed near a campgrounds, Dad took me into the office and rented a cabin for the two of us for the night. After he got me set up with a campfire and some wieners to roast out in front of the cabin, he took off after the dogman and the bears in the dark. I told him he was crazy and I asked him what he expected to find. He said he was going to find out where the fashionable bears and werewolves were hibernating that winter. And then he was gone into the pitch dark with one old flashlight and no weapon. For hours I wondered if those were the last words I would ever hear him say. When he came back it felt like Christmas. I didn't even care about the dogman anymore. I just wanted my father to have some dinner and hang out with me. He told me what happened to him anyway. He did not find out where the creatures were sleeping, but he did find out where they were heading. The dogman led the upright bears to what we on modern day YouTube might call a uh, food source. Let's not get into any more details than that, so you can just imagine whatever you would like to see the bears and the dogman eat. Maybe it was that new vegan burger from Burger King. Oh no, wait, they didn't have those in 1979 or whenever this was. At any rate, when my father saw that the animals were eating, he knew better than to stick around. That was when he came back to the little cabin we had for the night. I tell you, it felt like a castle, because I really thought I had lost my dad that night. In my 20s, I would talk to people about this story. It inevitably led to arguments, as back then, very few Bigfoot enthusiasts believed in Dogman, and nobody thought Dogman hypnotized bears and kept them as pets. But that part of it isn't just a theory of mine. That's something I witnessed. Back then, when I witnessed that strange scene, I didn't have an opinion on the subject of cryptids and high strangeness. These days, I do have an opinion. Instead of just saying that, though, I tell people that I'm knowledgeable on the subject. I try to make my opinion out to be the only possible interpretation. Not just my interpretation, but unquestionable reality itself. It's true that I've read a bit more on the subject of Dogman than back when I had no opinion about it, but not enough to be able to prove my side or my opinions conclusively. This is why I feel obliged to call myself an expert and argue for my opinions. It's because I know I can't prove my side without refutation that I argue for it, not because I think I can. And so it was with my dad that the more he saw his original theory fade away, the more he clutched at straws to try to keep the dream alive. But when he gave up trying to impose his idea of the world out onto reality and simply allowed the world to be what it was, then he saw the most amazing thing in this entire experience. He got to see the dogman or werewolf or whatever that thing was lead those bears to food. What was the meaning of that scene? Did he really witness cooperation between two species? Somehow it doesn't seem so simple to explain as all that. Doesn't it seem as though there were some uh, other element to all this? Were those ordinary bears? What is the nature of the dogman? What would have happened if I had lost my father to the dogman and the sleuth and the sleuth of bears? I want to tell you about a man named Paul. When they ask how much we give him, I say, Oh, I don't know if he's short or if he's tall. All in all, I know his name is Paul Essery. Please join us in thanking Paul Essery for making this episode possible. In return, Paul Essery gets all our fancy perks, including hours and hours of secret uncensored dogman stories available nowhere else. The Short 
snouted dogman of Oklahoma. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I've got a dogman story for you, and it's a weird one. It took place in the Sequoia National Wildlife Refuge, which is in Oklahoma. I know you don't get too many dogman stories from my state, but this one is not your typical dogman story. I'm in my early 40s and finally engaged to be married. This story happened back in 2018 when my fiance we can call Phyllis and I first started dating. Back then, she was into cryptids and ghosts and aliens and anything paranormal or strange. I liked horror and weird movies but was mainly into sports in those days. Actually, I was already losing interest in sports because they were getting woke even back then. That's kind of how I fell into dating Phyllis. I had all this free time because I wasn't sitting in front of the television watching men pat each other on the butts so much any longer. Suddenly I had time for a woman in my life. Now Phyllis, in those days, used to enjoy going camping just so she could be out in nature in the night and imagine all the big feet and space aliens that were probably outside our tent, you know? She'd have me swing sticks into trees and we'd both do Bigfoot howls like we saw them do on TV. I thought she was crazy, but I thought she was the most fun kind of crazy that I'd ever known. So, one day when we were in the Sequoia National Wildlife Refuge, we were walking on this big circular trackway they have that goes out into the swamp in a circle. They have it, you know, so you can get out into it and look down at it. Really immerse yourself in nature. This was where we had our very intense dogman sighting. We almost got literally immersed in that swamp. And here's how it went down. So, even though it's smelly over there on warm days, it was still kind of romantic walking out into the wetlands with Phyllis. After all, she's a Bigfoot enthusiast. So you know bad odors are not going to get to someone like her. Man, we were happy. So, anytime you're happy, that seems to set alarm bells off in the head of someone who is unhappy. Misery loves company. So if you're happy, there's quite often going to be someone who tries to take that away from you. In our case, that someone was the dog man. Okay, so we were in our own little world, walking out around the circular roadway, and suddenly we noticed a terrible, screaming kind of sound coming from in front of us. Running around from the opposite end of the trackway was something that I swear at first I took to be some kind of polar bear over there running toward us. When I focused my eyes, I saw that it was not as white as a polar bear, that had been a momentary illusion caused by the setting sun glinting off this creature's shiny fur coat. It was something more of a silver color, but it wasn't shaped like anything I could think of that should come in that shade or color. Phyllis was asking me what that was over there and I had no answer for her. We were both so confused by what we were seeing that we were not really paying attention to the fact that whoever or whatever that was, it was screaming and stamping around in an unhappy, one might even say, angry way. Rather than turning away from the huge, hairy, angry thing, we leaned forward and squinted at it, trying to see it better. Sometimes falling in love lowers your IQ, and I think that was the case with us. So this huge behemoth of an animal is running around the perimeter of the trackway, running toward us, and Phyllis asked me if it was a cat. I had been thinking it was a wolf because of the silvery coloring, but she was right that the tail was more like something from a puma than from a wolf. We watched far too long. We should have turned tail and run, but we were so confused and we were so curious about what that creature was. I swear the body looked more like a silver gorilla 
than either a cat or a dog. The front arms were a lot like gorilla arms, I thought, while it ran to us on all fours. The face of the creature was flatter than most dogs. It was something I guess like a pug dog face, although it wasn't cute like a pug. It was big and nasty, with long, serious-looking fangs and its scary-looking short snout. I was seeing such a combination of features that I didn't know what to call this big guy. And then it stopped dead in its tracks, and it did two things that changed everything. First of all, that creature sat there, sitting up like a cat or a dog, right? And it howled. Once that howling started, you had to place the creature in the canine family. I felt chills when that thing howled that way, because this animal was too large to be a dog. It was bigger than a bear. It had muscles like a gorilla. How could it be a dog? I don't even think wolves come that large. When it was as close as that, you could see that it was a short-snouted creature like a cat. Its ears were even large and triangular shaped and up on top of its head like a cat. And yet, we felt utterly confused because it acted so much more like a dog. And then the figure did something that flummoxed us even further. It stood up on its hind legs and bellowed, beating its chest like it was King Kong on top of the Empire State Building. I don't know why it took things coming to that for me and Phyllis to finally realize that we were in mortal danger and to run back the way we came. The creature bellowed again and made this sound that almost sounded like laughter from an evil man in an old science fiction or horror movie. I don't know if that creature actually laughed at us, but I know that I felt instantly cold and I shivered all over as I ran away. Whatever that thing was, it didn't want us around any longer. The trackway was muddy and I was sure the creature was leaving footprints that would make Jeff Meldrum salivate. All I cared about in that moment, though, was making my own trackway and getting myself and my girlfriend out of there safely. As we ran back towards safety, I could hear the immense beast lumbering down the road behind us. I guess I should say we felt him approaching in our bones as the entire landscape, including the water, seemed to shake and rattle each time he touched down as he ran. And yes, by this point, he was running upright like a man. How many big cats run upright like a man? Call the beast whatever you want to. It was catching up to us, and our time on the planet Earth seemed to be about to run out. A jeep drove recklessly toward us out onto the muddy trackway, almost slamming into each of us in a different way, but somehow slipping past. That open-air jeep was heading straight toward that huge silver-backed dogman. I visualized him reaching down and plucking the driver out of the vehicle, like plucking fruit off a tree. Phyllis and I turned and braced ourselves to see something truly horrible. Instead, there was a giant splash on the far end, as apparently the dogman had decided to make a swim for it. Something about that jeep told the creature that it was time to get out of there. I have no idea what about it was so scary to the dogman, but to this day I'm grateful that car got there when it did. I was already out of breath. I'm not sure how we could have gotten away if that driver hadn't arrived at the precise moment that he did. We were supposed to be camping in that location for another several days, but Phyllis's interest in nature seemed to evaporate, like the smell of rot on that body of water. She no longer dreamed of getting to see a Bigfoot. She no longer yearned to be abducted by space aliens. She still likes to read about the stuff. She still watches movies about cryptids. It's just that she had her fill of actually dealing face-to-face -face with cryptids on that one creepy evening 
in the Sequoia Reserve. So after we were back home, we started doing research on dogmen in Oklahoma. And of course, there isn't really all that much. We did come across information indicating that Oklahoma has been the home of a number of sightings of big cats, however. To be honest, I'm not sure if what we saw might not get classified as a big cat by some people. The flatness of the face might also cause it to be labeled as a Sasquatch. It might very well be possible that some of Oklahoma's dogman sightings are classified as either Bigfoot or Big Cat events. And this is because it's really pretty hard to figure out how to classify the short-snouted dogman of Oklahoma. If you're looking for fun, it's no sin to check out Mr. Spink's Drive-In. A channel that I love is Mr. Spink's, and I don't care what anyone thinks. Please join us in thanking today's executive producer, Mr. Spink's Drive-In, who has a channel here on YouTube that I subscribe to. Please check him out. He recreates a trip to the drive-in from the comfort of your chair. Mr. Spinks also helps our channel stay online, and in exchange we share with him our over 21 hours of secret uncensored dogman stories. Tales far too wild to tell on this channel, and you can share all these perks too. Just either join our PayPal subscribers club at peterbernard.com or else click that shiny jolly join button under this or any of our videos to become a Scary Stories channel member. Dogman in Prague Dear Scary Stories NYC, My wife's work took her to a city in Eastern Europe called Prague, and the two of us spoke about the great age and romance of the place while walking down a long outdoor medieval staircase that doubled as a connection between two very old neighborhoods. In the next instant, we were confronted with a figure of evil from out of another time and yet equally at home in the present, shockingly out of place and yet looking as though he viewed himself as a native. We found ourselves being pursued by a nasty-looking, seven-foot-tall, gray-haired, tall-eared, North American dogman, or maybe Eastern European dogman in this case. But of course, this wasn't the first time we had seen such a creature. In fact, we may have seen this very animal before, a year or so earlier. My wife and I are Americans, and although we've never discussed this publicly before, we did have a harrowing experience with the North American upright walking canid, or a dogman, while hiking and camping in the American state of Georgia. I need to tell you that story first, though you could understand the reaction that my wife and I had to the European dogman sighting. Without getting into any details that might identify her, my wife earns her living by finding things out for some very important clients. These days, she spends a lot of time behind the closed door on her computers and devices, but up until a couple of years ago, her job involved a lot of travel. Since I work online myself, that meant a lot of free traveling for me as well as I joined my wife on her adventures. I miss almost everything about those days, but I don't miss our encounters with the dog man. Even if I remember why she and I were camping in the woods in Georgia, I wouldn't be able to tell you about it. She did tell me why we were there, but... I could never remember, so it must not be an important part of this story. The important part is that we were completely vulnerable and in the middle of nowhere. Savannah, Georgia, and Richmond Hill are busy places. You can tell when you go to Google Maps and click on the little orange Street View Man. But check out those forests to the west of Savannah. No little blue lines or circles out there. Not as many, at least. From a distance, you might be fooled into thinking that nothing interesting was going on over there. Look a little closer, though, and you'll see there are actually roads ribboning their way through that vast woodland. And 
There are these weird-looking constructions strewn about here and there, but all so strange. I don't know if they're government or industry, but they look bizarre. And when we were in that area, we found the men who guarded such locations seem rather, well, unwelcoming. Maybe we caught them on bad days, so maybe that characterization of them is unfair. I'm just telling you what our impression was back in those days. Please do not go and bother whoever owns that land. You might find they are the worst kind of individual to mess around with. At any rate, we were somewhat intimidated by those men, and my wife and I were keeping the lowest profile possible while camping out in that area. We wouldn't even make a campfire. We were that concerned about remaining invisible. I've been listening to your channel and a few other ones for a while now, and I hear accounts of people being threatened by the dogmen at night while camping. In the morning, the scene has usually relaxed, as we all know that Dogman hates the day and loves the night. Well, our first Dogman experience happened as we awoke in those weird woods outside of Savannah and Richmond Hill and discovered that we were being evicted from our campsite by the Dogman. My wife stepped out first and screamed. She tried to go back into the tent, but I was rushing out to find out why she screamed. So... We sort of banged each other up a bit there. My rushing outside to help her had inadvertently thrown her at the feet of the very cause of her initial scream. In this way, the two of us were introduced for the first time to the Dogman in the woods of Georgia. What my eyes saw that morning made little or no sense to my brain. There was my woman lying on the ground as though she had been painted by Boris Vallejo for a fantasy paperback cover of the 1980s. Literally inches away stood a bipedal canine of some kind or breed of which I had never seen before. My wife looked up at the beast and screamed out a long list of truly offensive and unrepeatable sailor's sea curses which she had learned from the Irish side of her family. The dogman literally backed away from her as she stood up to her feet. I was wondering if he had a wife at home too. The dogman seemed so well trained to know not to mess with an angry woman. He had no corresponding fear of this savage young woman's mate, however. That would be me. Feeling a bit emasculated by my wife, the great animal went into a full-on display of dominance before me, even making a false charge to force me to back up a few yards. I was actually glad that it was making bluff attacks because that meant the dogman didn't really want to have to slaughter us. It just wanted us to get off its turf. It just wanted us to back off. I felt so relieved and so lucky that all we had to do to end this standoff was to back away. All we had to do was let the predator save face and then we'd be able to save our skins. I started to back away, and I looked around for my wife. I hoped that she was in full retreat, and possibly on the way back to our vehicle. When I didn't see her, at first I felt elated that our escape was going to go even more smoothly than I had hoped. And then, out of nowhere, there she was shouting at the dogman and lecturing him not to push her husband around. She was using all her fancy new words that she learns from her groups, and she looked like she thought she was really winning the argument. The dogman, on the other hand, looked like he just had enough of her, and he looked like he was about to knock her block off. There was an explosion, so loud, that it left me somewhat deaf, for way too long afterward, and I ducked down to the ground. Long before I was back up on my feet, that dogman had fled. It was an officer of the law, some kind of ranger or whatnot, firing that warning shot and scaring off the star of our story. My wife claimed the victory as her own and decided she had made the dogman leave. 
I knew better than to disagree with the way she remembered it. The important thing was that we had encountered the North American upright walking canid, or dogman, and we had survived to tell the tale. It was our first and only cryptid or paranormal event at the time, and we both sort of notched another mark on our belt, then moved on. We never expected for there ever to be a part two to that story. So that's why we had werewolves on the brain in Prague. It was not all that long after the werewolf incident, and Prague, to me at least, has this real vibe of old-school European monsters. It looks like vampires should be living there. So, my wife's work took us both to Eastern Europe, specifically the city of Prague, in the autumn of 2015, back when the world was still normal. That city has been lived in for so long that you almost expect to see fairies in the parks and vampire bats at dusk. But our dogman experience in Prague was unique even by the standards of such a place as that. There are parts of Prague built on levels different from each other. In that sense, it reminds me of Upper Manhattan above Harlem. Tall, tall staircases outside just to get from one block to another built much higher or much lower in elevation. There is one street slash staircase leading up and down a steep hill that we walked almost every day we were in Prague that year. It was always crowded, always, but on this one night, this night with a very strange atmosphere about it, an autumn night that felt like summer and yet left us shuddering and shivering as though it were winter. On that night, that staircase was desolate and empty. Our footsteps echoed in the streets and down into the deep valley just on the other side of the wall at the edge of the staircase leading down and down and down. The two of us looked at each other and I could tell that she also understood that something was strange about that night. Something was just wrong. Behind us, I could hear the dogman, the same dogman from the United States. It was slobbering and growling and doing the whole animal on the loose thing. And I knew, I knew what I was going to see before I even turned around to look. There it was, a North American cryptid in Prague, looking insanely fascinated by our presence, clearly salivating over us as though we were pork chops and applesauce. It was hard to run. It was hard even to walk because of the level of fear in my chest and my body. It was hard to coordinate putting one foot in front of the other. I had become so disoriented by seeing that dogman in a place where it couldn't actually be that I nearly felt as though I were lucid dreaming. We ran down those stairs and down that street and the dogman seemed to always be the exact same distance behind us. Why was there nobody else there? Where were the rest of the people who walked up and down those ancient stairs every hour of every day? How were we able to be singled out by the dogman in this seemingly impossible way? And then, when we hit the street level below, I heard traffic and people sounds, and it was only then that I realized that I hadn't been hearing those sounds as we ran down the old castle steps. It felt like a time slip, or I suppose more of a slip sideways into some kind of pocket reality or dimension. If the dogman were just a rare animal, it wouldn't have appeared in Prague, in a city. If it followed us there, it could not be a mere animal. It could not have swum the ocean, for one thing. Maybe if it could shape shift to human form, though, it could have taken an airplane or a cruise ship. Maybe it came over on the same vessel that my wife and I did. Maybe if it were a shaman or a brujo or a wizard, it would know how to create that pocket reality that my wife and I entered into 
when the dogman chased us down the old castle's steps in Prague. These days, with my wife working in her room, me working in mine, and neither of us ever going on trips any place, we don't have much reason to think about the dogman. But if the dogman could appear in Europe, then it could appear anywhere. I could run into it the next time I take the dog for a walk in the park, or the next time I take the garbage out at night. If the dogman is really a super intelligent shape-shifting wizard, as I think it is, then it's just as equally likely that you could see the dogman in the backwoods of Georgia as you could lay your eyes on <coughs> Dogman in Prague. Our EP today is not Ivan. Our EP is Mr. Spinks Drive-In. Please join us in thanking today's executive producer, Mr. Spinks Drive-In, who has a channel here on YouTube that I subscribe to. Please check him out. He recreates a trip to a 20th century drive-in from the comfort of your 21st century chair. Mr. Spinks also helps our channel stay online, and in exchange we share with him our over 21 hours of secret uncensored dogman stories, tales far too wild to tell on this channel. And you can share all these perks too. Either join our PayPal subscribers club at peterbernard.com or else click that shiny jolly join button under this or any of our videos to become a Scary Stories channel member. Dogman Cures Depression Dear Scary Stories NYC, I've got a really different kind of dogman story for you today. My wife slipped into a deep depression after we got married, and I nearly divorced her as a result. I know that sounds impatient of me, but she wasn't working a job. She was just sitting around the house all day, feeling sorry for herself, and somehow this was my fault. I was bending over backward to deal with her every mood swing and provide for her, as though she were some kind of royalty and all she could do was complain that I wasn't doing enough for her. In this day and age, I was stunned when all our friends took her side. Nobody could see it my way, and I was ready to change my name, move to a different state, and find a new bunch of more supportive friends. But then, my wife ran into the dogman, and he fixed everything for me. In my opinion... Dogman cures depression far better than any overpriced shrink, and I'm going to tell you the story of how he cured my wife and saved my marriage. Now, I never believed in cryptids, but I never disbelieved in them either. I had seen the Boggy Creek movie when I was young, and it scared me, but since I didn't live in Arkansas, I didn't really think too long or hard about whether Bigfoot was an actual thing or just something made up by someone who drank too much moonshine. And as for the dogman, I hadn't even heard of him until a year or two before this situation happened. I didn't have any friends or family who had ever had any strange run-ins with weirdo animals, so I sort of never formed much of an opinion either for or against. I know that as I was growing up, I saw honest people get ganged up on and smeared in my schools. I never did anything to help the people being dogpiled on, but I decided to always remember that when the majority of people suddenly tell you someone is bad or a liar, then you owe it to yourself to go listen to that person directly. If those who abuse their power tell you someone's a liar, I bet that person's actually telling the truth. And now that I've had my own cryptid encounter, which completely changed my life, my heart goes out to all the truth tellers out there whose truth makes the powerful uncomfortable. The fact that this story turned out for the best for me is practically a Twilight Zone ending. I sincerely hope we never encounter anything like the Dogman ever again. I get it now. Cryptid stories are often based on something real. I promise I'll remember that lesson, so I never need to see or hear a second one of these kinds of animals. I tell you what, 
These creatures remind you how close the end is and how quickly it can come. They make you appreciate being alive and that's what happened to my wife who I'm going to call Bathsheba. So the royal queen Bathsheba decided this past summer that she was tired of living at home and never doing anything. I reminded her of the whole pandemic situation. I work from home now. Travel is hard and slow, even if you've gotten all the shots that Big Pharma wants to unload on your poor carcass, and our relatives all live in lockdown states. I asked her if we left home, where would she want us to go? She said camping in the north. We live in Michigan. She wanted to go camping in the north of Michigan. After some questioning, I found that she wanted us to get a tent and go sleep in the woods. While I found the idea of getting the woman I loved alone in the woods the most exciting and interesting idea I'd heard in literally years, reality crept back into my fantasy and I started imagining all the reasons Bathsheba would find to be depressed once we were out in the middle of nowhere with no electricity or bathtub. We compromised and she agreed to let me rent us a small cabin with real electric plugs. We looked at campgrounds at first, then ended up using this other internet service to sublet someone else's cabin for the time period that my wife wanted. This way we'd have electricity and running water and a real bathroom and a real refrigerator. It was located right next door to the Hiawatha National Forest and so we could go for long hikes in nature. Then we could go eat a frozen Trader Joe's dinner and watch something on streaming. I was really looking forward to it and I was looking forward to my wife's depression lifting. Well, nothing was as she wanted it once we got to the cabin. The weather was to this. The bathtub was to that. I was losing time I could have spent working on my paying work gigs so that I could spend even more time listening to this pampered woman make me feel bad about how I don't do enough for her. It hurt. It was annoying. But this was the woman I loved, so seeing her in pain was probably the worst part of all of it. She was driving me crazy, and I was at the end of my rope. Finally, I decided to stay in the cabin one afternoon and do my job on my computer while she went for a hike alone. I was surprised when she didn't even make me feel guilty for sending her off. She just left, and so did the heavy feeling of sadness and unhappiness that she was carrying around with her. It was like there was suddenly more oxygen in the air itself when she would give me some space. I was so grateful for every single second of my life, except when she was around dragging everything down with her to a lower energy state. So when she ran back to the cabin screaming at the top of her lungs, I didn't even recognize her voice at first. I ran outside to help the screaming lady and was stunned to find that the lady was my own wife. I don't suppose I ever heard her scream in fear before. I'd only ever heard her complain and mope. She drank both coffee and tea daily, yet no amount of caffeine had ever gotten her to raise her voice in quite this way before. She was running toward me, red-faced, and the things she was screeching made no sense whatsoever. Her eyes looked frightened but I didn't think she'd gone insane. Her clothes were intact. She didn't appear injured. I tried to understand the words she shouted as she ran and staggered back toward me in the cabin. And then, crashing out of the woods behind her, I saw what my wife was screaming about. There was a dog chasing her, so large, that it made my mind flip around inside my own skull. It was a weird feeling it gave me, like deja vu, but not deja vu. The dog looked too large for the scene. He looked like a living optical illusion, 
and it reminded me of things I had learned about the reality of dreams. This creature was something from dreams, or at least nightmares. It wasn't supposed to be here with us while we were awake. When the beast was fully out of those woods, I could see that part of the reason it seemed so tall was that it was standing up on its hind legs, not down on all fours. So it was actually smaller than I had first thought it was, but it was still as big as a really large adult male bear. I mean, it was way, way too large to be a human being. This was an animal. The legs were too long and too tall for it to be a bear. It walked on dog legs. Well, I mean, the hind legs. If you look at rear legs on a dog like a German Shepherd, then imagine them bulked up on steroids. That's sort of what the legs on this big dog looked like to me. Its front legs were more muscular than your average canine as well. The head of the beast was a giant-sized skull of a creature that looked like a German Shepherd with much larger teeth than it was supposed to have. The fangs in this mouth were also out of this mouth as there was no room to put weapons that large inside a canine snout. Its claws were as long as a bear's claws, but they weren't arranged all in a row like you get with a bear. This nightmare dogman had his claws arranged more like a hand. Not a human hand exactly, but a hand like some kind of a monster. Let's face it, he had werewolf hands, and the claws looked like they could slice your face like it was a loaf of bread. I grabbed my wife, and we ran like the blazes. We got back in that cabin, and the beast was right behind us, making sounds halfway between a dog and a raging bull cow. The upright walking dog beat on the cabin door like he really intended to knock that thing in, then knock us in as well. I held my wife in my arms, and she felt as fragile as a bird. She shivered and just kept saying she wished it would go away. Tears streamed down her cheeks as the dogman slammed its body into that front door over and over again. Quite frankly, I had no idea that the owner had installed such a well-built security door. Maybe he had already had dealings with this same dog-headed behemoth. I hid my wife in the cabin's bedroom closet. Then I went out to the front and looked out the window, viewing the insane mongrel on its side. In the shadows, the eyes of the creature glowed an almost amber color, as though they were lit from within. I left that window before the creature saw me looking at it, drooling out there, and I went and spent the night in the bedroom closet with my wife. In the morning, she was a woman who had been humbled. She wasn't complaining anymore, though. It wasn't being blamed on me. In fact, she kept thanking me. Thank you for protecting me last night. Thank you for massaging my sore neck. Thank you. I would like to drive into town for breakfast. She was the woman she had been before we got married. Over our scrambled eggs, she told me how she thought that we were both goners the night before. She told me that she never expected to see the sun that day, and that seeing it was a true miracle. She looked out at the parking lot, seeing the sun rising in the sky, and tears came from her eyes. It wasn't because she was feeling sorry for herself anymore, either. It was because she was in a place of gratitude, and it's only from a place like that where you can truly see real beauty. Look, Dogman is a bad idea. It's a bad thing. It's not good for you. It has a bad temper, and it can eat you alive. Trust me, you don't ever want to meet one. But if you do, and you survive... You might find that the air tastes a little sweeter once the dogman is gone.
Meeting the dogman is like staring death in the eyes. After that, you know the exhilarating feeling of living on borrowed time. Every remaining moment of your life is a gift. And that's why I say it. And that's why I mean it. Dogman cures depression. We're rhyming with Simon and busting with Justin and our executive producer, Justin, we're trusting. Please join us in thanking Justin Simon for making this episode possible. In exchange, Justin gets to see our secret uncensored Sunday night stories. And so can you. Just either join our PayPal subscribers club at peterbernard.com or else click that shiny jolly join button under this or any of our videos to become a Scary Stories channel member. And now, here's international TV spokesmongrel Henry Lee Dogman to fill in the rest of the deets. Hank? Thanks for watching till the end. If you liked what you saw, please consider clicking like on the video or sharing it with your friends and family that you think might also be interested. If you would like to see more of our work, please consider subscribing and hitting that bell icon next to the subscribe button so that YouTube will alert you when we put out a new video. To become a channel member and gain access to our special perks, you can click that join link under each of our videos. Another option is to join our PayPal subscribers club at peterbernard.com. You can join for as little as 99 cents on YouTube or a buck fifty at peterbernard.com, and that gains you access to our weekly secret uncensored episodes. If you'd like to see our 21 hours of archives of uncensored dogman stories, then please join at the three dollar level or above. To get to watch our shows in advance of the public, please join at our ten dollar level. That gets you all the perks. If you join our channel memberships, you need to check our community page here on YouTube in order to get the links to the secret videos and other perks. If you're in the PayPal Subscribers Club, Peter will email you all the news and links himself. Once joining the PayPal Club, which is Peter's homemade club, please give him a chance to see that you've joined and to compose you a personal welcome email as none of that is automated. But whichever you join, we'll name you an executive producer for the next available episode. Do you have a scary experience that you'd like to share with us? You can email us at scarystoriesnyc at gmail.com or call our Scary Stories voicemail hotline at 804-LA-SCARY. That's 804-537-2279. It's a Google voicemail box, so that means it keeps cutting off after every three minutes. If your story is longer than that, Please keep calling back, and we can piece it together on our end. Good night, and have a scary tomorrow. Come back for more scary stories.